Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, an oral history podcast about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners. Loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this podcast and just tell me what they do all day and let me record how this affects us. Thank you for listening. What did you want to be when you grew up? I was thinking about this and like a lot of maybe kids, I wanted to do something quite creative. Um, So basically, at some points I wanted to be an actor, at some points I wanted to be a musician, and I always wanted to be an artist. I have literally no idea why, because Mm. I didn't know what that meant, and none of my family are artists. So, yeah, that was a bit of an odd one. The, The sort of acting, again, I think that was just a bit of a sort of flight of fancy, because I actually really, really don't enjoy sort of being on stage <laughs> or anything. Um, but yeah, I did sort of um, try to dabble with a few different instruments and things, you know, sort of as a teenager. Um, but yeah, the, the art thing is the thing that sort of obviously stuck. Did you do any performance then? How much stage time did you do? Or did you just veer just towards the- musical instruments to hide behind or? Um, yeah, so just at school. But I mean, to be fair, I did actually join a band. I was, <laughs> despite the fact I said that I don't enjoy being on stage, I actually did sing in a ska band when I was sort of around 20 to about 23. Just a sort of local band. Um, yeah. Which was quite fun. But yeah, again, utterly terrifying. Um, mm. So I have no idea, kind of. It was just sort of one of those spur of the moment things that you just sort of decide one day to do with sounds. You're listening to Series 4, Episode 11, and to my guest, Louise Atkinson. This is another Zoom interview, recorded on the 8th of February, 2023. Louise Atkinson is a visual artist, researcher, and educator specialising in the relationship between art and ethnography. She works in a range of media and techniques, including artist books, postcards, drawing, textiles, sculpture and digital art, tailoring her approach to meet the requirements of the project or artwork. Her recent projects embody ideas of representation, artistic interpretation, curation, participatory practice and social justice. These include working as an artist researcher with colleagues across applied linguistics, disability studies and heritage. She is currently based at the University of Leeds as a visiting research fellow producing practice-based responses to Chinese wallpaper in British country houses to explore the ways in which the decorative arts form part of a broader cultural agenda encompassing notions of taste, trade and national identity. She is also co-founder and director of the High Rise Project CIC, a social enterprise that aims to facilitate people in and around social housing to tell their own stories using art and creativity, as well as running the online visual arts opportunity platform Curator Space. In her spare time, she likes to learn languages. Right, let's do this. Episode 91 of Working Hours with Louise Atkinson. Cool. So I'll go straight into what you're doing now then. So what, what are you doing now? Um, now I'm a visual artist. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Go on. So, so what does that involve? Ex- explain, you know, what, what's your day-to-day and what's it like? <laughs> what are you doing? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there's not really a day to day as such. Like, it's not wouldn't be a sort of, you know, every day I start blah blah blah. You know, it's always varied, and I think that's why I like it. So, as I said, I have no idea why. I sort of wanted to be an artist or how I became an artist in a way. It was just sort of something, you know, I always wanted to do. And then, you know, I, I don't necessarily believe in fate, but it feels very much like I knew that I was an artist before I became an artist. Mm. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I kind of forgot about it for a while when I was a teenager, sort of focused on GCSEs and I was sort of quite academically focused. Mm. But then I sort of got to like 16 and I just sort of had enough of all that for a little, a little bit. So I just sort of took some time out of, after school and then ended up going back to it um, when I was 20. Mm. So I, did you have any push to do like an office job or a day job or get a trade or? No, nothing really. I, I mean, I, there wasn't any sort of pressure. It was just sort of like, I, I just didn't feel passionate about anything mm -hmm. as in particular. So, you know, it was, it was almost like I had to have that time away just to remember what I actually wanted to do and what I valued, which was really, really useful. So visual artist, that's can be quite expansive. So is that film photography, stage painting and you know, vis vi the whole gamut of visual media. That, yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, I, I call myself a visual artist because I don't necessarily specialize in a particular medium. It just sort of depends on what the concept is and how that fits. Um, so I would say I don't generally paint. I'm not a painter. Um, I feel like that's quite a specific medium to choose. Mm. Um, I do use a lot of digital, I'm starting to use some more animation. I'm really interested in getting into AR. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of textile sculpture, ceramics, drawing, book making. So basically, yeah, a lot of zines as well. So yeah, <laughs> just basically, again, it's similar to the idea of, you know, just being in that visual artist in general, it's sort of on the just take going where the sort of idea takes me. Mm. So, I mean, you, you sent me a bunch of links yesterday of, of various things. So you're involved in a lot of projects and it seems to be a lot of project work. Yeah. But it also sounds like there's other things that you're doing alongside or to complement those projects as well. I would assume that fairly large projects you would be seeking funding for and getting the funding and then working on a funding basis yeah so uh, i mean i do at the moment i'm regularly involved in a few projects i run um i have my own practice i run a community at cic called the high rise project i don't really want to talk too much about that because i think you will be talking to my colleague about at some point yeah but i can mention you know bits and pieces I run an arts opportunity platform called Curator Space, mm -hmm. which again sort of sits alongside the, the arts practice. And I'm also a visiting research fellow at the University of Leeds. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, so, so I have a PhD in fine art mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I sent you on about a project called Multilingual Streets. So as well as being an artist, in my own right, uh, I work as an artist researcher alongside other researchers, mm. usually in um, social sciences. Yeah. yeah. So there's a big push towards social science to kind of use arts methods, to kind of explore these different questions from from a, an arts uh, and kind of broader humanities perspective. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I do work with um, linguists uh, and also people in disability studies. Mm. Uh, to explore different questions around, mm. yeah, the what the sort of stuff around multilingualism, and mm. um, that I'm working on at the moment. So, um, so yeah, I'm also co-writing a book with the, with someone. So yeah, as I said, it's like it's hard to really quantify it. And when you say it out loud, it sounds 
quite overwhelming and sometimes it's overwhelming, but it's, it's, it's exciting. So let's talk process rather than practice. I mean, normally the question here is how did you get into it? So I think these kind of go alongside each other potentially mm -hmm. for you. So, cause I'm imagining that it, it was a process of, you know, your practice, your practice was process it was just doing things and refining that and getting bigger and doing more complex things and trying new things. Is that fairly fair to say? Yeah, I would say that's, that's probably the best sort of way of describing it that, I've, that I think I've probably heard. It's yeah. just, yeah, there's, there isn't really a clear path. Mm. Uh, as a visual artist, um, it's not sort of like, I mean, there are pathways, but most of the way that people would understand being an artist is A, you're a painter and B, somebody kind of sells your work for you or you sell your work. Neither of those are really true for me. So I don't make work to sell. I, I have sold work, but not sort of intentionally. Yeah. Uh, more, more kind of, it was, yeah, particularly during COVID and obviously that maybe comes later, but we, yeah, I, I sort of did some paintings just to pass the time and I did put them online and then people buy them, but I did try to sell them. <laughs> so yeah, yeah so, so the process thing is, is definitely something, yeah, it's very iterative. It's sort of, see what, you know, I, I've got this idea you know, or maybe there's somebody else has got an idea and they want me to work on it and then just see when we put those things together, what happens mm. and then keep going like this, basically. So, so what would you say is your, your first time? What would you consider like your first kind of real piece of work? Well, actually it's probably before I went back. So I did, I did a foundation and then I did a degree. So probably before I did the foundation. So in between sort of leaving school and going back to, to college, yeah. I uh, sort of just started organizing exhibitions mm. with, yeah, with two other people. And yes, yeah, so it was quite, yeah, self, self-organized, self-motivated before Facebook even. So uh, before MySpace, mm. so <laughs> back in the day where we had to like actually go around and fly your places mm. to look at people. So yeah, I just started organizing exhibitions and kind of bringing people together and just learning on the job as it were, just sort of like just trying, you know, trying out different, different ideas. Mm -hmm. Were you in Leeds the whole of that time then? or That was actually in Wakefield. Right. We um, managed to get in touch with the curator of the, the City Art Gallery at the time. So before the Hepworth. Mm. It's the City Art Gallery, um, and they just so happened to have a break in their program. So basically, we could sort of use the one of the spaces for a month and have like a little exhibition in there. And then we did we organised another exhibition in in Leeds underneath where Friends of Ham is now. Mm -hmm. So that used to be an art sort of art gallery shop type thing, and then they had a space underneath. But yeah, that was that was. Quite, it's quite funny to go back down there now. I don't know if you've been to Friends of Ham, but the yeah. sort of now from Id Id Aromatics, um, which I noticed is just closed down as well. So yeah, just you know that very kind of sensory memory of that smell when you're invigilating in the space, <laughs> sort of brought it all back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just smells are like instant, aren't they? Where you mm. it'll just take you there in an instant. Yeah. So. So you've made it sound quite easy so far. So this is this is not the artist's story, is it? You know, we want we want struggle. So what are what are the kind of the obstacles that that you faced? I mean, you must go through periods where, uh, like, you dry on ideas, or you're kind of like you you just feel creatively exhausted. Like, what's what are the kind of difficulties and the downsides? What what have been the pitfalls so far? Obviously, it's not easy. I'm, I'm sort of reflecting on like, I don't know, 17 years of, of practice. So, you know, when you reflect on it, it's obviously easier to see kind of the pathway. One thing led to the other, yeah. Yeah, 
Um, so, yeah, but I think the difficulties are still difficulties. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's ever a, a shortage of ideas because there's just so much inspiration and it's just sort of, in, if anything, it's too many ideas. So, you know, as sort of as a artist, academic, I also sort of work with students and, you know, I don't think artists have a problem of lack of ideas. It's just, yeah, you know, maybe this is sort of a generalization, but often I see it's more the focus. Mm. And that's definitely a, a big issue for me is basically how do I focus on this one thing, which I think the ver the variety is a way for me to almost not avoid it, but circumvent it. Mm -hmm. sort of keep that interest going mm. but yeah so that focus can be a big challenge and as I said overwhelm uh, can be a big challenge because uh, again I think part of it is because as an artist you well even working and teaching students and things I work on sort of short-term contract like a freelancer if not always on a freelance contract which I which I prefer to be honest Mm -hmm. But it does mean that it's hard to turn work down because mm -hmm. one of those kind of feast or famine things and you just feel like, oh, I need to make sure there's always something in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. But from a from a, a perspective of, you know, being self-employed or being on your own in a way, you know, it's it's difficult. You don't have anybody telling you what to do but you also you know don't have anybody telling you what to do yeah <laughs> so, um, you know which I, I mean i don't like being told what to do. yeah but a lot of the time you need to be told what to do don't yeah. you? like sometimes you're kind of like i don't know what to do somebody tell me what to do yeah 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 it would be is this right have i done this thing right <laughs> sorry yeah 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 so um so you know but but again it's about for me i don't really I don't really, this sounds a bit, maybe a bit, I don't know if the lib's the word, but it's kind of like, if there's like a a problem like that, then it's like, okay, I don't want to feel like that. How do I make that not happen? So, you know, then I organize a, a crit with some other artists who are feeling the same, you know? So it's not like, I, again, it's, it makes it sound easy. It's not easy, but it's just a sort of reflection of, many many years of making mistakes and mm. you know, seeing what works and seeing what helps but yeah and and I think a big one and I think probably for a lot of people as well who have been working in the same same sort of industry or the same sort of job for for a while and they've kind of maybe achieved a certain thing is mm. that imposter syndrome is like a huge a huge thing which seems like almost you know that it doesn't make sense the sort of more you learn about something the more you kind of feel like you know I'm like can I even do this mm. but um it seems to be yeah so it, but again I just see that as like it's just something that never really it's not something you can you can think your way out of or even work your way out of you just have to live with it and you know just carry on regardless if that makes sense because it does do you work or do you prefer to work i suppose you can look at it both ways do you prefer working collaboratively or do you prefer to work on your own or do you like to have a balance of doing your own thing and then working with other people because i'm also thinking about in terms of your own training and your own development are you always self-taught or do you like to sort of pick things up from other people and kind of apply those techniques and ideas into what you're doing? Like how, how do you like to work? I think my practice has grown so much from collaborating, to be honest. And I do like to kind of work on my own as well. I do like to make things on my own and I will sort of sit on my own and work. But um, a lot of the projects that I'm working on are a uh, collaboration. Yeah, I think it's it's just so beneficial because, as I said, you get out, you know, you, you have that thing where, you know, you can bounce ideas off people, you can learn skills from other people that, that they know, or you can even 
not be responsible for doing that thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think when when you're an artist and you you just feel like, oh yeah, I have to write the statement and do the promotion and do this, and and obviously you do all of that, but the idea that somebody else could do some of that mm. for a project is quite amazing. <laughs> Which I know a lot of people probably take for granted because when they go to their job, you know, they do their bit and somebody else does, you know, the other bit, whatever it is. But then when you're like the accountant and the marketing person and the content producer and the, you know, curator. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Client wise, has that been a matter of mostly you being really proactive and going out and and seeking the work and finding the people or have you had quite a lot of people sort of come to you and clients come to you with ideas and work and what what's the the balance like has that sort of changed over time or has it been consistent like how does that work for you um yeah so in the first instance it's it was very much sort of applying to open calls um, so, so I mean, I, I set up um, Curator Space with my partner, who's a web developer, and basically that was, came out of doing sort of applying for open calls, but also doing the curating, which I, I sort of been doing that since '99 or something. But yeah, it was it was very much sort of applying for things and and getting my name out there, or trying to get my name out there. Um, and showing work in exhibitions but over time obviously especially just being based in Leeds and people knowing you and knowing what you do and you know using social media to promote what you do Mm. people then start coming to you because obviously you know you've been going if you've been going for quite a long time then you become more reliable and you're Mm. sort of more of a, a known entity so I very rarely apply for things these days but I'm also very sort of self-motivated in the fact that I will t- make a lot of my own opportunities. Mm-hmm. So sometimes like, so with, with the, like, for instance, the high rise, you know, we apply for a lot of funding for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people will commission me, but sometimes it'll be very much a sort of self-directed project. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and then it becomes a mix of both because as I said, like they, while you while you're kind of working on something, you'll get approached by somebody else. Mm. It kind of fills in those times where you know you're not never waiting for something or or needing to approach somebody because you can just make something. Which I think that is for me that is um, like a huge lesson that I take from being an artist: just the idea that you can just make something happen make something exist you don't have to find it or wait for it Mm. you know (laughs) yeah just manifest it yeah it's in my head it can be out in the world (laughs) that sounds quite magical (laughs) (laughs) but yeah no you can just make it happen yeah and again like (laughs) i keep thinking you know reflecting on what you said about you know making it sound easy it's not easy but it is doable (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, uh, making something look easy is part of an art, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> that's an art form in itself, isn't it? Yeah. Have you, because you were saying earlier, you know, being in that self-employed mode, it's very much like keep working, do all the work that you can while you can sort yeah. of thing. Do you have the freedom to turn work down or have you had to work up to a point to get that freedom? Or are you still like, no, I have to do this because it's a job and it's money and and you know I can make something of it and I need to do it I mean yeah I I do have the freedom to turn work down I do you know basically I think you know there's a lot of work and there's a lot of people that need that work so you know like for instance the other day someone calls me about um, doing some teaching it's just basically, it's just not really the right fit for me at this, at this moment in time. But I'm also working with a lot of people who would probably benefit from that opportunity. Mm. So basically, I just sort of said I can pass that on to people that I'm working with, you know, might find that opportunity useful. 
I could probably try and fit it in and it would be more money, but it would also be taking away um, from an opportunity. I, you know, I've done teaching and I've just sort of been sort of doing two hour workshops here and there. But then when you do a two hour workshop and then basically it can take up your whole day, even though yeah. it's only two hours. So then you're like, okay, I need to almost lose money to give myself the time to be able to do something else, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. I, and it's, I mean, it's something anyone with a business can recognize as well, that there's the, you know, or anyone with a job, you know, like there's a, there's the costs of the job before yeah. you're even earning, you know, you've got yeah. to get into work, you've got to pay for your fuel or your bus fare or whatever. Yeah. And you have to take those costs into account. Mm. It's I like, mean, well, uh, that's a lot of effort. What's the reward going to be? Yeah. I also think about opportunity costs mm. again, which, which doesn't help with focus at all. Cause then you're always mm. waiting out, oh, if I do this, what am I not going to be able to do? Um, so it's kind of like, wait, I know, you know, the, the saying, you know, bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or something like that, but it's kind of like the opposite of that. Like if yeah. I don't, if I don't do this, will I potentially get the other thing, which will be better? Uh, three birds three birds even. yeah <laughs> in 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 both hands <laughs> yeah yeah so um which is yeah that again so you know if i agree to something then well, i'm not going to be looking for other things but mm. yeah i do need to weigh up opportunity cost and again that's something that it's a risk you know mm. because you don't want to turn things down because you don't know when you might need that opportunity in the future but yeah, that's why I think having the opportunity to basically say, oh, you know, I can't help you do this, but I can help you in other ways. I can help you find somebody who can do that, who would probably get more benefit from it is another way to think about it. Yeah, well, referrals are always useful as well because yeah. you you get brownie points if they pick up the work and they, they you know, they're grateful for that work and yeah. the place is happy that they've got someone that's, in the remit of what they were looking for so yeah. uh yeah it's a kind of win-win for people yeah and hopefully I, I, it works coming the other way as well yeah yeah no I, i've definitely been referred um for for projects you know where people have seen something and then they recommended me to somebody mm -hmm. so yeah i definitely you know think that there's a benefit to just sort of yeah share it sharing it out for them yeah yeah, yeah. So I want you to think back to going into lockdown. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, in an ideal world, because I started this 2020, I would have been capturing so much of this, but it was just, we were locked down. Yeah. <laughs> Everything seemed closed. <laughs> it was just like, how do you, how do you get people? I did send a bunch of emails out. I heard nothing back from any of them. Yeah. I just assumed everyone was shut. Um, but yeah, so sort of going into lockdown. So I want you to think about what time you did lockdown, if indeed you did lockdown, and how that affected your workload, sort of work-life balance, all that kind of thing. But also the changes coming out of it, like has anything changed for you? Um, well, you know, permanently, has there been any changes or effects on your work from COVID that are kind of continuing? So yeah. Yeah, just take us through your kind of lockdown journey and just sort of how that's changed work for you. It was horrible. It was ho it was so horrible. For about a week, I thought, oh, this could be, a, you know, relaxing. Did you, you know, know what you were going to do, though? Like, because I would imagine most of your work is going out into the world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so... Um, we had curator space at the time, so that sort of brings in some income, but that was quite stressful because a lot of the people who use curator space are also self-employed artists. Mm. So it, you know, it was, it was really stressful to think about how we'd be able to support people and, and just generally, you know, I mean, it's not kind of part of the role necessarily but it you know it does obviously weigh on your mind because you know from a personal experience because that's what I do mm. um so yeah that that was quite just generally 
sort of stressful feeling, you know, kind of thinking about the impact on everybody. And trying to be like a rock for people. Yeah. So, so internally you're going, what the hell am I going to do? Yeah, yeah. We did have um, a very um, ill-fated attempt at producing some kind of remote course platform, mm. which was very sort of quickly, I mean, I wouldn't say cobbled together because I'm not the developer and I, you know, he's very good at what he does, but it was very quickly developed. Okay which kind of worked for a bit and, you know, made some really good connections actually through that. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like, what can we do to, to give people the opportunity to earn a living mm. online? So, yeah. So, you know, eventually we sort of, and we didn't charge anybody for that. We just sort of offered it as a, as a thing. And we, but yeah, it was, that was quite challenging. But from a personal perspective, yeah, nothing. I didn't have um, all my work stopped because... Obviously, you do a lot of stuff in the community. Um, I was actually finishing the project at the time. So the multilingual streets, I was over in Manchester. So we'll have to get on trains to Manchester and decide, you know, do we go this week? Do we not go? Mm. Because it was about multilingualism, multilingualism and the, the school in um, North Manchester had uh, had like sort of new arrivals coming in all the time. Um, again, it was sort of like the really, yeah, trying, trying to decide, are we being, are we being paranoid? Mm. You know, we, if we close this thing down, because I think everybody was, and, you know, obviously there was a lot of, how can we say it? Like, I think yes, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you know, everything's fine and just carry on and da, da, da. Just felt, yeah, like. I'm not, I don't know what to do for the best. I don't, you know, I, as I said, I've, I've agreed to do certain work. I, you know, if I basically say I don't want to come in, mm. are they going to be like, well, don't bother coming back then, you know? Mm. So it's really, yeah, it was really difficult. So, yeah, I think I locked down on 17th of March, if I remember rightly, which is sort of relatively late, but I think the actual lockdown was like 24th, maybe. It, I, it varies. I think we've all got different dates in our heads. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, ideally I wouldn't, you know, it would have been before that, but um, it's basically because I had these contracts and it's kind of like, I don't really know, you know, what to do. So yeah, basically there were a number of things that had to be finished remotely, but yeah, but obviously it was so difficult. So I'm not really surprised you didn't get any responses in mm. you know, at that time because I think it was just so overwhelming mm. that it felt like, you know, well, <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. We don't even know, you know, how can we plan for something in the future? How can we, yeah. even, you know, we're just watching people in Italy singing on balconies at the moment, you know, <laughs> which <laughs> quite, quite bizarre when you think about it. But yes, yeah. about a week I thought, oh, it's a nice rest. And then after that, I was just like, I can't concentrate on anything. Lost any focus that I even had, you know, realized actually that I was, I really, really needed to move and go different places to actually think. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, just walking around. Being confined is bad for you. Who knew? Yeah, that? yeah it turns out. <laughs> I was like, I can't think straight. Uh, so yeah, so, but, but yeah, I had to curate a space, which we were just sort of, again, trying to f figure out different ways to, to kind of provide services for people um, that would enable them to carry on working in some way. We, uh, we were already doing a bursary from that. So we basically um, switched that to some smaller bursaries so that we could support more people with little uh, pots of money. And... Yeah, like we pyrise again, like, you know, we're just sort of thinking through all our projects. Um, we had, we just received, we, so we started high rise. Don't want to talk too much about it, but we started it in July, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we just had our first big part of funding, um, which we applied for in February, 2020. Um, and then we heard back about it and it was like, oh, we want to give you this money, mm -hmm. but obviously we can't yeah 
<laughs> so, but it was really nice because they actually, I think we were in a, actually a really good situation with that because, and again, I think through having practiced for a long time, we got ourselves in a position where we were in charge of that budget. Yeah. So we had a lot more say because I know there were a lot of people who, who were contracted to do work, but then they weren't in charge of the budget and then that, that budget just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, I think from, from, um, you know, any kind of advice perspective, I would say, yeah, it's always good to be in charge of the budget because then you can be in charge of, you know, you can have the conversation with the funders. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and ideally your best place to spend the money because you should know ideally at that point where yeah. the money needs to go and what you need to spend on and what's the priority for yeah but yeah it's better. so a lot of uh, funds that were given um were deferred mm. so yeah that that made 2021 very interesting because then we we're delivering 2020's work and 21's work mm. Because obviously you need to live in the meantime. So, you know, sort of living on money that you haven't earned yet and then having to re-earn that as well as the money you also need to live on now. Which is harder because it's kind of like, well, that money's gone and it's spent now. And it's like, yes. well, well, I have to I have to work for it, but it, it's already gone. <laughs> it yeah, it wasn't <laughs> spent. It wasn't spent because we didn't have it. Yeah. But obviously, yeah, still. Yeah, anyway, so it was that, that was... It was all round not a great time. I mean, you... that's probably an understatement of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Did you manage to kind of find work then through lockdown or was it signing on? No, I got a size grant. Hmm. So I got a couple of size grants while I was um while I wasn't able to, to kind of go out and earn money. But um yeah. I mean I Did... would I, I didn't sign on. Yeah. Could you furlough yourself through your business or anything? Was there any? No, 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 because I'm self-employed. Yeah. So it's not a sort of class, I don't think it's class as furlough. It was, yeah, I mean, that was an interesting thing as well. It, it really highlighted the challenges. Well, for, I mean, financially speaking, obviously there's like so many other challenges, but financially speaking, I think it really highlighted a lot of things around the way that people work and earn a living mm -hmm. because obviously you know self-employed people really had nothing for a while mm -hmm. so yeah the, the size grants were a good sort of step in the right direction but I don't think they really came up to the same sort of level as the furlough mm -hmm. and because the furlough was given on the basis of what you earn now whereas the size grants were I'm sorry, I'm saying size. I don't even know. It's self-employed, some S-I-S-E-I-S-S. -E -S -S. I don't even know what it stands for. But they basically were an average of your last three years' earnings. Right. You can imagine, well, 80% of that, I think, which you can imagine is varies widely. And a lot of people who were, so if people had had maternity leave or sickness leave or anything like that, that basically just meant they were so sort of down on their on their income. Um, and also if you were, so like, I, as I said, I sometimes teach students, um, but in that case, I'm employed on a short-term contract. So again, that doesn't count towards any self-employed income. So if people are employed on short-term contracts and then all of a sudden, because, you know, they're not needed, the contract disappears, mm -hmm. then that's basically not classed as income mm. which yeah so just so many so many issues with with all those kind of things and you know working out who yeah how to how to be fair about it mm. um as i said i i didn't like struggle that much because obviously uh, people weren't spending a lot of money you know there wasn't really a lot of money to be you know, to spend on anything. Mm. So um, it wasn't such a struggle in that case. But um, yeah, it. I think yeah, it was it was uh, it, an interesting time to to just reflect on you know 
the way that people are valued differently and the way that people, you know, how, how, how people make a living and, and, you know, how that's seen. Mm. Mm. And I suppose the why of it as well, mm. that, that that's the point of this podcast is this sort of, you know, why, why are we still working? Why are we working more? We've got all these yeah. machines that increase productivity and, you know, we've got all these things that we can automate and, you know, most of the world is built. Okay. There's a lot of crumbling infrastructure that needs <laughs> to be prepared and so on, but it's kind of, why are we spending so much time working at this point? Yeah. Uh, COVID gave us a really unusual chance. Well, some people obviously, but I mean, it's not nothing that 2 billion people were locked inside their homes for yeah. months, months on end. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think that we've, you know, we've not even begun to reckon with it yet. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I have to say I, I missed working. Did it just flatline for you then? Were you kind of a bit like me, sort of twiddling your thumbs, kind of, mm, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I, and just... It's, that was really funny. So, as I said, during COVID, I uh, I just started painting pictures of dogs. <laughs> There's nothing to do with anything that I do. Yeah. I was like, I'm just going to look at pictures of dogs on the internet and paint them. Mm. Um, and that's what I did. <laughs> it took me a long time. To be fair, it took me a, a real long time to get to that point. So I started making them. Um, I joined somebody's Zoom session, mm. uh, which was like an experimental mark making thing. Mm. Um, again, like this was probably maybe two or three months into COVID or something like that. Like up until that point, it was just like <laughs> Ferrero Rocher for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> yeah. It was that basically that kind of. Um, you know, that scene in uh, Queen's Gambit where she's like, just giving up. <laughs> but less, less romanticized. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So were you, I mean, how much were you crawling the walls? Did you have places that you could get out nearby? Did you have like garden space? Like, could you, were you really confined or could you kind of go out a bit? And um, Well, at the time I lived in Armley. Um, so, so I'm um, guessing you were quite confined. Yeah, fairly confined. I mean, there are, to be fair, there was a really, uh, there is still a really nice Polish bakery in Elmley. So that was nice. So, you know, so it was basically walk to Town Street, go to the Polish bakery, you know, call, um, was it Power Stretches or something, get some hand cream because it's like, how are my hands so dry all the time? <laughs> no, that was a thing. You know, we're just like, what? How often am I not washing my hands? That <laughs> is so dry. So, you know, um, the Wortley rack was like a huge thing. Um, did a, a, a sort of half hearted attempt to uh, couch to 5K, I think, around the rack. Mm. Yeah. So, but but yeah, I only had like a small backyard, but that was actually like a real, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, a lifesaver because, mm. yeah, it was just having that, that little bit of outside space. Mm. You know, my, one of my colleagues who lives in a high rise in the shop, she could tell you all about that, but um, yeah, it wasn't sort of that situation by any means, but yeah, I was still very much crawling the walls in, in terms of, you know, I'm used to working in cafes and you know going out and about and seeing people and chatting to people mm. and, and it was just the yeah just not knowing when it would end not knowing you know and again as, as you said obviously the the added stress of you know when am I going to be able to to work mm. you know I, I already had projects that I needed to finish but I had no focus or concentration I think when you've got almost no deadline, there's no incentives or motivation to to finish something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it was you know at first it was kind of like oh yeah this is maybe two months or something and then it's like longer and longer and longer. Mm. Yeah, and in the meantime, you know we've got projects that we think can you know people are starting to put things online. Mm. Then it, that's like a whole 
or the learning curve in a way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we did have, we had a project, we, we've got some money to do a project for refugees and asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was sort of a embedding English into creative activities. Mm -hmm. So we were like, okay, so we've got to teach ourselves how to deliver online to people who don't speak English and, and teach them to do this creative thing that they've never done before. Yeah. Basically, we just try to put things off as much as possible. Yeah. Until it became clear that we couldn't put it off anymore and we had to sort of bite the bullet and get on with that. Yeah. Because it was so long and there was a lot of, I think a lot of people were kind of like, well, it'll end soon. They're like, it yeah. must end. Like, it was just a cup. It can't go on for another two weeks. It can't, you know. And then other people were like, this is it forever. It's yeah. This, this now. Uh, so, yeah. So it was e and it was easy to go between the two extremes as well. Because yeah. we had so much time. Um, I mean, it sounds like you, you had a hell of a lockdown, to be fair. I, it, it doesn't sound like it was a good time. No. So, I mean, well, what do you think it's, it's changed for you coming out of that? I mean, b being forced to have that much time you know you you're bound to reflect and then not having the work because i would imagine you do a lot of your your own thinking through your work is that yeah. fair yeah. so i mean it must have just been you know like having your hands tied behind your back right well yeah how, how has that affected you now are you do you just have you turned into a workaholic or are you kind of like i need to balance things better have you adjusted where you focus in your income generation from what what's changed yeah i think the balance is definitely a thing i think it i mean I, I, I say that and probably that doesn't sound like your case you know when i'm like <laughs> doing this that and the other but i think yeah I, I do feel like i'm balancing more i am saying no to things for a start mm. uh, but i'm also i think i don't think I wouldn't say I'm a workaholic. Other people might disagree, but I, I think I do actually um, take a bit more time if I'm ill, for instance, like before, I think, and, and I think it's, in a way, it's kind of going back to how it was before, but um, I think for a certain amount of time, we were kind of like, yeah, we, we can't keep going into work when we're ill. We need to actually you know it's not fair on us and it's not fair on the other people around us mm. or at least i think most people thought that um, mm. but i don't know if that's something that's continuing you know when i see people and they're coughing in public and mm. <laughs> you know spitting or something and you're just like what needs to happen yeah, so, so someone coming into the call center, into a call center or a workplace or whatever, and yeah. like sneezing everywhere. It's like go yeah. home. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if there's the same, you know, willingness to to allow that either. You know, now it's not sort of this sort of deadly virus. I think you know people are like well, but it's you know, still there. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, just uh, last week. Um, my colleague got um, COVID mm. um, and I don't know if I had it. I was ill, but um, yeah. It's all, yeah, yeah. not great. No. So we'll we'll move off of COVID and we'll go, uh, they're all happy for, for a while. So we'll go from COVID to let's do climate change before we do social media and then we'll finish on Brexit and then we'll move into the, the happier questions. Okay. <laughs> so... In your work, what can you do to raise awareness around or promote adaptation or mitigation of climate change? Is there anything you can do? Is it kind of a consideration for you or is that something that's, I can't really think about that. I've got to just get on with work. I mean, it's definitely something that's obviously, you know, is being an issue for a while but it, it's something that I think is definitely coming more into the subject matter of my work. 
mm. as well as some of the the kind of um, materials and methods. Um, and also, uh, you know, as I said, applying for funding, it's, you know, there are now sections about, you know, how are you going to mitigate this and these kind of things. So obviously that's something that is just very visible mm. uh, in that sort of sense. I think it's it's hard when you kind of make things um, to think, oh, I'm bringing, you know, as I said, you know, the the and the brilliant thing about being an artist is bringing something into existence that didn't exist before. But also, as I said, that's that's a challenge because then it's like, oh, this is more stuff. Mm. Do we need all this stuff? Mm. Which you know, that's how I don't know how you how do you balance that? You know, mm. um, you know, just become like purely conceptual artist and just you know, or make things from recycled materials. But I think again, that it's a very particular aesthetic and a particular decision. Mm-hmm use those materials but yeah so so yes yeah, i think it's a it's a constant question and it's a constant challenge it's just about maybe a shift in mindset about you know what your what what does it mean because again it's like uh, i'm thinking about so, so for the for the um visiting research fellowship i'm thinking about um working with collections and you know that then that whole idea of conservation mm. or you know it, it it takes on a different meaning when you're like why are we conserving things what are we conserving them for mm-hmm. who how long are we gonna be here mm-hmm. but yeah and then and then thinking about it from a perspective of like a, a lot of ideas around art are around sweating your assets so like you make something and then you can reproduce it on this, that, and you're there to print on demand services and all this kind of stuff. So, but again, then you're like, it's more stuff. Mm. So you can make a living out of selling products or merchandise, mm. but you know, how much more, um, you know, matter is that? Well, I think as well that, I mean, are you aware of Passive House? Do you know Passive House? No. Okay, so it's this like really high building standard, which basically should pretty much be the standard for building houses, really high insulation standard and really good airflow. But one of the things in that in their design process is that they take the whole life cycle into account. So mm-hmm. they're looking from creation to destruction and like mm-hmm. so taking it down again and getting rid of it. I think it's move into a, a circular economy or move into a regenerative pr- process, you know, like not just producing and this focus on production, but more to maintenance, mm. and more to how do, like, how do we get rid of the thing? Mm. You know, like what, we, we don't think about the end of things. We think about producing a thing and then oh, it, it just goes away, but it doesn't go away because the world's round. No. Yeah. So I think it's that, like, you know, think about how it will be taken apart. Think about what it's made of, how it comes together, and then think about how it ends, you know. I suppose, yeah, coming back to that question of conservation or collection, you know, most artists don't want their thing to disappear because that's potentially an investment for somebody. You know, most people who buy art, they don't, they want to buy something that's going to last. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of, over things that are at odds and I think you know it's similarly with the you know the idea of growth mm. is kind of like how much more can you grow mm. because you need more stuff you need more innovation sort of thing I bet even like from a uh, you know using digital or using technology obviously like I use technology a lot in the various different roles that I do the impact of that people were like Oh, we could just send an email, and that would that was that's you know somehow carbon neutral. Mm. You know, before they knew better, mm. so yeah, I think um, it's it's basically it's I think it's an ongoing question, and and as you said, yeah, definitely uh, the idea yeah. of what the sort of cycle is, what the lifespan of the different materials, where 
you know, the the miles that it's taken to, to get to wherever it needs to be sort of thing. For me, there's not really a simple answer. I mean, I, I get, I'm reminded of them. When, when I was doing my PhD, I was really interested in collections, um, ethnographic collections, mm-hmm. uh, and the sort of almost the opposing factors where people were collecting ethnographic objects from certain cultures that, you know, they basically made something to be destroyed or to disintegrate. Yeah. And then this like, almost like a battle between the curators who want to keep this thing mm. preserved and, you know, the, the sort of makers and the owners of the thing who really need it to not. Mm. But ultimately it's not going to anywhere because everything fades away, you know, mountains, yes. slides, <laughs> um, and is regenerated, you know, yeah. recycled and, um, so yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to leave that there for now. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that's something for someone to ponder. Right. Let's do Brexit, as I said, and then we'll do social media. Okay. So, um, it's been two years now since we Brexited. What has it done to your work? Uh, what are the brilliant benefits that you've gained or the terrible <laughs> consequences that you've endured or the absolutely no difference that it's made <laughs> um, i mean so i mean you say it's been two years but it feels like a lot it's longer it's been two years <laughs> i know but um i mean for me really it's because it's like you know it's like june 2016 and you know in my mind it was all a big joke and it was all a big oh yeah don't be ridiculous, you know, going on holiday and people are like, oh, you know, after the referendum and, you know, you'll, you'll lead da da da. And you're like, ha ah, yeah, that's funny. And then you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. And I was finishing my PhD in, uh, I finished my PhD or I submitted my thesis in September 2016. Yeah. So like from June to twi- from June to September, it was basically like just refreshing the the browser. What now? What now? <laughs> that did not help. Mm, mm. Yeah. You know what? What just, now? No, Everyone the- arguing. Nobody yeah. knows anything. From a personal perspective, uh, it wasn't ideal. I remember the, the day after the referendum, I was actually. Um, delivering uh, an adult community workshop in Chapel Town. Um, we were making, I was teaching people how to make books, bind to their own books. Mm. We went in and it was just, just silence and shock. Mm. And I basically just said, I think we just need to sit and have a cup of tea. Mm. <laughs> so we just basically, and it was like the most British response ever. We're like, shall we make books or should we just have a cup of tea and a biscuit mm. and just, you know, cry or just, yeah, say what we need to say. And, you know, and yeah, it was, it was just horrible. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I mean, it's, it, to me, it, it's a similar kind of thing with COVID. It's kind of you you had Brexit and it's like, okay, so everything has changed now. We basically just had a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> a bloodless revolution. Uh well, mostly. And everything's changed, but nothing had changed. Everything's the same. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. The same buses running down the same streets. And mm-hmm. and COVID was similar in that like everything's changed. Okay, the buses weren't running down the street, but mm-hmm. you know, nothing else there wasn't chaos chaos outside our windows mm. it was like everything has changed but really it's all the same except we're, we're not going out mm. yeah i mean um it's a, it's not how an apocalypse should be is it in, in no. stories and stuff it's like I mean, everyone should be running around apocalypse. screaming yeah yeah no um uh, so brexit yeah from a, from a personal perspective uh i don't think it's it's not necessarily impacted on me uh, more than sort of the average person, I don't think. Mm. 
Were you uh, mainly working nationally? You weren't sort of doing inter- that much international no. work or? Well, Curator Space is international, but again, I don't think that that's really had much of an impact because that's B2B. It's not exporting. It's not. What about supply issues, anything like that? I would imagine you're not material intensive. No. So, yeah, that's that's not really an issue. I think for, it's it's mainly for artists. It's mainly those who sell abroad and so kind of any kind of like tax or customs type stuff is is a challenge. But so um, yeah, from a personal perspective, it, it really encouraged me to focus on learning more languages. Because mm. mm. as I said, I do, I do the stuff with multilingualism and I'm really interested in, you know, speaking different languages. So that was almost a bit like a, a fuck you know, to <laughs> the idea of being a sort of separate place of split. Basically wanted to, I don't know. Or even being more, le- you know, being less cosmopolitan. It's like, it's yeah. nice being cosmopolitan. It's nice to go around and try different things and have yeah. different things. And... So, so yeah. So last year, for instance, um, I went to Germany for a month and did work out there, like work on my work while I was out there for some of the time mm. uh, because I'm not, you know, fantastically wealthy that I can afford to just take a month off work. But, um, you know, it was basically, oh, well, I'm just going to pretend like I live here for a month mm. uh, and just act as if I live here, um, but carry on. Whereabouts doing... were you? Comstalus. Oh, I don't know. Was so it, it was... Oh, is there a big, big lake? lake yes, the big yeah. lake yeah. Um, called the Bodensee, and uh, it was on the Swiss border. Mm. So if you ever want to practice German, don't go to Switzerland. Because <laughs> you think they're speaking German, but but they're not speaking German, they're speaking Swiss German. Yeah. But yeah, it was very everybody was very friendly. Constance is a bit like like a, a sort of holiday destination for Germans. Mm. So it it's it's like quite a nice city. Um but yeah, it was basically an idea of being a bit of a digital nomad. Mm. So me and my partner went and hung out and did some work and then took the train up to Octoberfest. Oh, nice. Yeah. Was so, that messy? It was that bad. <laughs> yeah. So nice. that that was fun. Came back with COVID. Oh, thought, yay. Um, I think everybody at Octoberfest got COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But thankfully it was at the end. Like, so basically I didn't test positive until I landed back in the UK. So, but yeah, it was bound to happen. Mm. Yeah. So I think that from, from a, a Brexit perspective or from a personal perspective, I think Brexit definitely, I mean, I was learning languages before, mm. but I think it, it really, I don't know, just gave me that sort of stubborn motivation, which I think is probably something that I, you know, apply to most of the things that I do. Basically, when people are like, oh, you know, that sounds hard. It's like, right, that yeah. sounds like a challenge. Yeah. You can't do that. I can't. Watch me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is that is that a Yorkshire thing? Is that a... <laughs> I think that's that's just a stubborn person thing, I think. That's a stubborn person thing. <laughs> but I think you need, you. you also need that kind of, you need the conviction and energy to carry it through because a lot yeah. of time, you know, when it get when it gets hard, you have to have that resolve and the spite of like, no, I am going to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it, that way, it's in your favor, and sometimes that you know can work against you. But yeah, some, things. yeah, sometimes you can destroy yourself doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so talking about the potential to destroy ourselves, let's talk social media. Oh God. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, social media in your work, do you have to do it? How much time do you have to spend on it? And is that a valuable use of your time? Do you see like the actual benefits coming back from social media? Do you see a tangible results or is it kind of something you feel obligated to do and you kind of throw stuff out occasionally? Like what's, what's your working approach with it? Um, I mean, I think like, like most things are basically trying to think about if I'm going to do something what am I using it for? And so I do try to think quite critically about these things. I mean, I say that, I mean, obviously I've got 
personal social media, which is just like, you know, cat memes mm. and, you know, ridiculous, ridiculous things that I find that I want to share with people. But hey. yeah, from a work perspective, it's, it's really <laughs> interesting. I am, um, you know, we're talking about reflecting and sort of seeing how something happened. Mm. I think uh, one of the reasons I did a PhD was because of being on Facebook. Mm. So basically, um, I joined Facebook and then I could see, obviously, coming from MySpace mm. <laughs> uh, back in the day, we, I could see I was going to spend a lot of time on this thing. Mm. So I need to make sure that I'm doing, using it for something. And, mm. you know, again, double-edged sword, most of the things that I do become work mm. because that's, I'm a project-based type person. And I think, oh, you know, I, I really try to keep things separate, but sometimes they just become work because, the, because I'm just working. So yeah, basically though, I'm going to make this social media thing work for me. Mm -hmm. So um, it was sort of, this would be 2008, start of 2008, maybe. And I uh, set up a Facebook group. I got really into saying I I do a lot of book, I used to do a lot of book binding. So basically I thought I'm going to, I'm going to set up a Facebook group um, because I just sort of started making artist books mm. again so it was between finishing degree and doing a phd and realizing oh i don't really have a lot of space to make work mm. but if i make them as books then you know i can take them anywhere mm. and i won't have to store i won't need to and have loads of space to store them so yeah i started making these books and then i thought i'm gonna set up this facebook room and i'm gonna find other people who make books um, so I set up this Facebook group called Artist Book Collective and basically just started, it, you know, people started joining it from all over the world and thought this is an opportunity to start curating some exhibitions. Mm-hmm. So I curated an exhibition and then my, the person who then became my supervisor came to see this exhibition, who also um, run, uh, runs the um, Leeds International Artist Book Fair. Or it's called the Pages Book Fair mm. at the university. So he really liked it. And then I created another exhibition on campus and he basically said, Oh, you know, we want this to be part of the book fair. Mm-hmm. So it's basically, yeah. So I think because at the time he was surprised because there were like people from, you know, the States and China and Mm. Uh, um, was it China? Oh, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But basically, like, a, a, you know, a lot of different places mm. who were exhibiting in Leeds and, you know, it was like, oh, how how are you getting, how are you connecting with so many people? Mm. You know, which was, it seems odd now to think about it. But at the time it was like, yeah, how do you know somebody in Japan? And how do you know somebody in Russia? And easier to do because there weren't, all the sock puppet accounts and fake accounts and, mm. you know, made up accounts because people that were on it then, there were less people. You were going to real people. Yeah. And it, yeah. You know, and Facebook wasn't about, you know, or social media in general wasn't about misinformation and yeah. like misdirection and so on. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, so that was, so basically I did a few of those exhibitions and it, and it was like, yeah, how I think it was still a bit of a, a revelation mm. for, you know, again, uh, and, and, you know, thinking back to, you know, what we said about, you know, going around and flyering and stuff like that. It's almost just like a continuation of that with different tools. Mm. Like basically like, how do I find people that I don't already know who might be interested in this thing or how do they find me? Mm. So just sort of using those same principles. Mm. And yeah, and basically at some point, this person then approached me and said, oh, we really want you to do a PhD and um, we can help you get the funding to do it. Mm. And you went, yeah, sure, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. How, how was the PhD? Again, yeah, it was, 
really, really interesting, challenging, varied, and then I had to write it up. <laughs> then I had to do the work. Yeah, yeah. When you're yeah. finding things and you and you you know sort of experimenting and and reading and all this collecting and mm. all stuff, and then at some point you have to stop doing that and you have to make sense of it all. And that's the challenging part. But yeah, four four years it took me. But yeah, it was that. I mean, that's a job in itself, mm. which is obviously you know you get paid to do it. Mm. Well, yeah, you, you get some funding, whether yeah. it stretches the whole way or not is... Uh... Well, no, the funding, <laughs> the funding was for three years, but um, you can, well, I'm not, I'm not sure now because that has sort of finished in 2016, so I have no idea. I think they do like you to finish in three yeah. years. Yeah. Then, but yeah, so, but, you know, being an artist at the time, I was like, I'm getting paid regularly. Um, so I was just able to save some of that money mm. for the fourth That's year anyway. What was the workload like? Were you, were you okay with, did you have the time to take on that level of study at that time? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. To be honest, it, it was um, a college studentship. So basically I was doing a PhD in my own work. Mm. Mm. Like a PhD in myself, which sounds like not a thing but um yeah but it's knowledge production and it's like production, yeah. yeah and what better knowledge is there than than you know experiential practice yeah so it's like, it, yeah, it basically all around it was called um souvenirs from the british isles which was supposed to be about um using auto ethnog ethnography um as like a an a approach to exploring collections but then because it because it kind of came out just after Brexit, then sounded like really parochial. Mm. <laughs> like, God damn you, Brexit. <laughs> you made me sound like never. <laughs> a, there's a weird tension with it because there's this, from a climate perspective, there's a, you need a, a, an international, global resource management architecture and infrastructure but then from a social political level we need to be more local mm. locally producing and so and there's this weird like i think that i i i'm going off on a tangent now so <laughs> just, just bear with me no worries. Um, i think that for example like the categories of left and right have collapsed mm. because you've got left wingers who talk about right-wing talking points and right-wingers who talk about left-wing talking points mm -hmm. and everyone's all mixed up and everything's all intermingled with with each other and I think you see that tension with this sort of local and there's like a need for locality and making things smaller and more about you know the immediate mm -hmm. group but like uh, 15 minute cities for example yeah that kind of thing which uh, again you know that's something that's been turned into a talking point but it's largely u.s based it's like most european cities are designed for walking mm. because that's when they were designed yeah you know, they've been changed afterwards for the car whereas in the u.s they were designed for the car and it's a total nightmare yeah. um so but then that's something that's been political politicized it's like oh they were the we don't want 15 minute cities. It's like, well, you do actually, that's probably the thing that you do want. You want yeah. local businesses and local shops and local amenities. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? You know, you don't want to go into town or into a, a, a parking. No. You know, we don't want a retail park to go into town. Yeah. Like, or, or drive to a retail park. Yeah. I think I, I don't understand the, the problem with it. I think, yeah. Look, I mean, I feel like everywhere should have those local amenities. Mm. You know, like Armley was really great for being very close to town, mm. but I feel like it shouldn't be just about being able to get out of Armley. Mm. That you know, there should be, and and there are sort of obviously various different bits and pieces, um, kind of that are in Armley. Um, it's just being able to spend money there and go to the pub there and stuff like that was a bit of a challenge mm. so, yeah mm. yeah um, it's um 
But again, there with with Armley, a lot of that you could say a lot of that's caused by the roads, like how mm-hmm. busy Town Street is, and then Stanley Road, and that intersection going up there by what used mm-hmm. to be Mike's Carpets. So, yeah, but there's and it's really densely populated, so it's kind of all the services are kind of oversubscribed. But there is a big, you know, there's a community spirit there, and yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on, and the Town Street is healthy with shops and so on yeah uh, so there's a lot of strengths but then there's difficulties with it as well yeah yeah I've just noticed it's starting to snowing as well yeah so that was that was a bit of a diversion but I do think there's this it, it you need to kind of reclaim a nationalism without it being tainted with nationalism kind yeah of I think I think um but yeah also from a yeah from a from a climate perspective you know food miles, you know, you want kind of to, to support sort of, you know, British farmers and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to go into the last question, which okay. is a change question. Um, so if you could change any three things about your work, you can be as realistic or unrealistic as you want on this. So you could change any three things about your work. What would they be? I honestly... I really don't know. I mean, three things is quite as the same thing. But well, that's but, it. It's like one thing is fairly easy, but three things is hard. Well, I don't know. I think one thing is one thing can be difficult as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think anything because um because you can change your work. Yeah, I for can a do start. One. <laughs> so if I if I want to change it, I just do. So if there's anything that we haven't covered yet that you want to talk about or kind of highlight, flag up, um, or if you just want to give out your socials, where people can find you, find your work. Um, yeah, so over to you to say whatever you want. Um, so I do a lot more on Instagram, lately, trying to at least. So yeah, I am Believe Me The Artist on Instagram and on Twitter, but I try not to do too much on Twitter. If I can, but... Mm. Um and Louise Atkinson artist on LinkedIn and Facebook. I also run Curator Space, so that's Curator Space and all the usual uh culprits, although that is mostly automated. Mm. Try to automate that as much as possible to cut down on the admin mm. of that. And occasionally um the high rise project uh or High, uh, leads high rise on twitter mm-hmm. so yeah they're, they're my i think three main socials but yeah it's it's quite a lot of work although i've got a system i've just started implementing the system these days where i'm trying to use it as a motivation to do work because again it's like especially with personal projects if it's um you know there's there's no deadline that nobody i'm not having to fulfill a contract mm. then this is maybe something that gets put put on the back burner mm. so i'm trying to basically post more regularly to a schedule on social media so that i'm um, basically i'm like oh by then i need to have produced x so that i can share it mm-hmm. but it's not so much for the promotion it's more for the accountability mm. Does that make sense? Is it how's it going? Is it are you keeping to it? So I was I got ill on Friday, so this week's been a bit of a write off, but I'm using it as a sort of week to sort of take stock and reflect. But yeah, sort of nine weeks so far, I think, mm. which I was quite quite pleased about. And I'm posting a lot more on LinkedIn, which I feel a bit weird about, but um, because I, I I just don't know, you know. I read LinkedIn posts and they all seem to be, you know, high value, you know, social media. Yeah. This is what I'm going to do for you. And I'm like, I don't talk like that on social media. Yeah. It, it's changing. It's changing. Yeah. You're seeing more kind of different posts. Um, yeah. But I think, uh, I think it needs to. And I yeah. Think, so it's, in part this is a reaction to kind of that this sort of LinkedIn presentation as if everyone 
you know, which you saw to a degree with the response to COVID as well. There's this sort of like the only worker in people's minds is the office. Mm. So like just people go into office and you're either like grunt level or yeah. you're high flying hustler, you know, getting all your doing doing all your hustle stuff, working 80 hours a week doing yeah. God knows what. And it's this as, as if people don't do other jobs, as if yeah. there aren't other ways to work, as if there aren't other careers, as if there aren't, you know, other ways of skinning the cat. Um, mm. And like, so ideally, this should be showing that there are other ways to skin a cat, you know, like whatever a human activity is happening, somebody's got a job doing that somewhere. Yeah. So a, a great one on Instagram the other day of a panda cuddler. That's a oh, job. Oh, I've seen that. <laughs> that would be a lovely job. Okay. <laughs> for a little bit. Because yeah. after a while, you're a bit like, okay. You have pandas now. Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to go that dark, but. <laughs> no, I mean, just like, yeah, I, I've cuddled enough pandas now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like I, I, I have done this. No, not get rid of them. They're getting rid of them themselves. They're, you know, the appallingly evolved animals. <laughs> food that doesn't give them enough energy and they won't reproduce. So, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, whose who's yeah. fault's that? That one's not our fault. I mean, the habit, the habitat destruction is, but the, mm -hmm. them not eating and not reproducing, that, that's on them. I did once see a video of a panda eating an ice lolly though, which kept me going for a little while. You know, the dark days of COVID. Very useful. So a bit, a tiny bit of dopamine. <laughs> um, that's, that's all. That's how we live now. Just, you know, for the next dopamine hit. Yeah. Keep us going. <laughs> Basically, yeah. The, 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 to the next panda video. Yes. Next oh, dog video. Next <laughs> dog painting. Yeah. No, I mean that that was a surprising a surprising turn up. And it, i think it was a little bit um it was quite it's always quite funny to sort of just stick up some kind of thing which is like how she can draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, well that's the thing. If you don't say and I know this from a, you know, from a, a, a consumer's perspective, let's say, mm -hmm. like, if you see someone who calls themselves an artist and they're like doing all sorts of different work until you can see that they can actually draw or paint, you, you like, yeah, you're not a real artist though. <laughs> and then when the, when someone can, you know, especially when someone does something that's like abstract or a little bit kind of more, more modern, let's say, um, people will be quick to kind of write you off and then you then they see them do some actually good fine art or technical drawing and it's like oh you know oh they can do it they have got chops <laughs> it, it's ridiculous you're only allowed to be an artist if you do that even if you don't do it for your <laughs> well, job that seems i can do this i just choose not to <laughs> yeah yeah well you did fine art so you, you must yeah. be able to no that, not necessarily that's not what that means fine art is more about the concept than the technical skill but yeah I can draw and I can paint but I choose mostly not to well there's uh, I mean there's plenty of people that that do that and you know we're doing those those no. but I'm... there are plenty of artists who can't do that yeah uh, and they're still artists as you said you don't sound convinced. No, no, I'm convinced. I like I have quite a broad definition of art. Yeah. I would, I would say that this is an artistic project more than a yeah. A a business or academic project or anything like that. It's I would like to think of it as ethnography, but and as oral history and, and so on. Whether other people will see it that way is a, a different matter. But that's another thing with like you mentioning imposter syndrome. This mm. thing of you know that even like you said calling yourself an artist like that's the thing that you need to get over because mm. to a degree you're kind of like well I, I, only other people can call me an artist because mm -hmm. they, they have to judge and if I was a real artist then they would see my art <laughs> um whereas calling yourself an artist is like well what, 
who are you? Who are you to call yourself an artist? It's like, well, I'm me and I'm going to do something. Yeah. I'm going to do Green. something. You got to call yourself a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it took me till I finished my degree to to be able to call myself an artist. Which, um, but that's just from my own perspective. So basically, I think you make an art, you're an artist. Mm. That's the end of that. Thank you again to Louise for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Tell a friend, sell a friend on it. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. If you want to be on working hours, you should be either in Leeds or from Leeds and you don't have to be in work to be on working hours. You just need some life experience and an opinion. Send an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com to get involved or give feedback on episodes of Working Hours or if you'd like to make an anonymous appearance in the Working Hours podcast, email westernstudios at protonmail.com. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. And or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month for loiners. There's also an outlander tier at five pound a month for non loiners and a 12 pound a month big time tier for anyone who's flash. If you're happy to make a regular contribution but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to LibraPay, that's L I B E R A P A Y dot com forward slash Western Studios forward slash donate and donate from as little as a penny a week all the way up to 89 pounds a week and people say i'm pessimistic again you can also make one-off donations through libra pay which you can do either publicly or anonymously remember that the first series of working hours is now on youtube go to youtube.com forward slash at working hours podcast 4618 Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain, and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios western studios leads can help you realize your podcast for only 25 pound for an hour of podcast work need podcast production recording editing or any podcast admin doing need it all doing or maybe you want or need a podcast presenter or co-presenter for your podcast project for only 50 pound per hour i'm more than happy to take that on for you Email makemypodcast at western-studios.com to get your podcast made. I am available to third sector organisations, small to medium sized businesses and individuals who want to make podcasts or other digital audio content. Want to make some fundraising case studies? Want to show off your expertise in your field? Want some help creating your podcast and format or just some support learning to podcast and getting going? Whatever your podcast question or need, get in touch with Western Studios Leads. Go to westernstudios.com and use the contact page to drop me a message about either working hours or about your own podcast project.